doing an incredible job, right? Man, if you are, if you are 1985 or older, you just had some flashbacks. You know what I'm saying? You young pups in the room are like, what is that? You know, we kicked off this series last week, if you weren't with us, called Guns and Roses. And we kicked it off, and I explained that I was riding in the car with my little girl, Ava, one day, and we were listening to Sweet Child of Mine. And I started looking at her and thinking about the truth of that's how I feel about her as my daughter, and that's how God feels about us. And it sparked this series. And last week, we kicked it off with the song, Welcome to the Jungle, talking about how this world is our jungle. And there's only two choices. There's kingdom or there's culture. One of the two is in drive in your life. Culture is not neutral. Culture wants to influence every single thing that you do, every decision that you make. And we, as believers in Christ Jesus, have to be intentional about allowing kingdom to drive our lives. And we allow kingdom to drive our lives. We allow kingdom to come through our lives when we substitute things of culture for things of kingdom. When we speak life instead of gossip, when we worship rather than worry, we're allowing the kingdom of God to come through our life. And today, obviously, we are talking about the song, Sweet Child of Mine and Our Identity in Christ. How many of you in the room have a driver's license? You have some form of what we call ID, right? Identification, ID. And it has a picture of you on it. It's how we identify ourselves in culture. We identify ourselves through an image. If you go to the airport, they're going to ask you for your ID and they're going to check it, the picture on the card against your face. Here's the challenge that we have. Our identity from the kingdom of God is not simply based upon our image. It's something much deeper. When God calls us his sweet children, his son or his daughter, that's from a place of identity that he's trying to put in us. But we are naturally mirrors. We tend to reflect that which is in front of us. Now, almost all of us looked at a mirror before we came in here today, right? And, and when we stand in front of the mirror, and for those of you being blinded by the light of the mirror, I'll move it as soon as we're done with this. When I stand in front of this mirror, what I see is, like, I see some clothes, right? Like, did, did, I, did I get them ironed? Are they clean? I, I'm checking my glasses and my hair. I, is my watch on right? Are, are, are my shoes right, you know? When we look in a mirror... What we see is an image that we believe reflects who we are. We see this image. I'm going to pass this down so we don't blind everybody anymore. We see this image in this mirror. And here, here's our challenge. We look in this mirror and culture tells us to see hair and makeup and clothes and shoes. And, and is your outfit just right? That's what culture is speaking into your identity. What you look like is what matters most. Now, here's the problem with that. How many of you know that all of the things you see in a mirror change? Clothing style changes. You begin to age a little bit and you, you get some wrinkles in some places you didn't know some wrinkles could be. And you start a church and all your hair turns gray. <laughs> Things change in this mirror. And that's a really difficult thing because if we're pulling our identity from an image that we see in a mirror, from a picture on a card, then what happens is our identity feels like it's always changing. It feels like we're always being sold something new that we need to be. But God is unchanging, everlasting, irreplaceable, and wants to seat in you and me a permanent identity that is unchanged by culture because it comes from the kingdom of God. See, culture's mirror reflects what we see more than who we see. When I look in a mirror, I don't often go, you know what? I see a father, I see a believer, I see a son of the Lord God Almighty himself. 
I see dominion over the earth, which is my role on this earth that God has given in me. I see faithfulness. I see hope. I see joy. I see love. No. I see gray hair and wrinkles and Harry Potter glasses and a jean jacket. (laughs) Culture's mirror reflects what we see more than who we see. But check this out. In Genesis 1 and 27, going way back in the word of God. It says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God created mankind, you and me, in his own image. And you're like, but, but an image, yeah, I want you to understand. In the image of an invisible God. Meaning that the image reflected from culture's mirror is not what should form our identity. It should come in the form of our pursuit of the characteristics of a holy God. Culture or its kingdom. See, culture's image is a subjective perception from the outside. But kingdom identity comes from a source of ownership and authority. Culture's image is who people think you are, and don't we strive to make people think that we are something special. But kingdom identity is who you really are. Culture's image is passive, but kingdom's identity is active in your life. Culture's image is looking back, but kingdom identity is looking ahead. When I think my culture's image is my identity, I get lost in the pursuit of a changing culture and I'm now chasing after something that I will never have and never achieve, which is culture's genuine affirmation and anchoring of my soul. Anchoring of your soul will come from kingdom identity only. Now here's the irony. We allow culture of this earth to change our identity But God gave us dominion over the earth so that we could change the earth. We allow culture to constantly change our identity. And the irony is we as believers have dominion over the earth so that we can see his will be done, his kingdom come through us so that we can change this earth. My my friend wrote this as we were kind of game planning through this series. He said, God gave us dominion over the earth, told us to be fruitful, to multiply and spread his image throughout the earth. He gave this mandate to Adam and again to Noah. Jesus rephrases this mandate when he tells us to make disciples of all nations since it is salvation that brings about the indwelling of the spirit and the spirit is our avenue to be restored to the perfect image God designed us to bear. As an Arkansas, you're my brain sometimes short circuits dominion to mean hunting, fishing, and chopping down trees. <laughs> but our dominion over this earth, the role that God give us, is more. It's math, it's science, it's medicine, philosophy, art, engineering, athletics. It's so much more. Dominion over the earth means so much more. And God showcases the authority that he bestows upon us by bringing the animals to Adam for him to name. Assigning names is a symbol of dominion. He says, I think the broader context of Genesis 1 and 2 implies that this dominion was not limited to just animals, but to all creation demonstrated by God only naming day and night and the heavens and seas. I believe he left the rest up to us as a gift to exercise our dominion. God gave us dominion. I want you to think about the significance of the role that God has given you and me with dominion over this earth, doesn't that speak loudly as to how much he values us, as to how much he trusts us, as to how much he wants to see his kingdom come through our lives, as to how tied to him he ultimately wants us to be so that we're no longer bearing an identity of this culture, but we're bearing a kingdom identity. You see, kingdom identity is not a title. It's a gift from the creator. You ever wonder like why your name is so significant? Your name naturally becomes associated with your identity, right? Becomes a part of who you are. 
That's why moms and dads, you shouldn't give your kids goofy names. You know? They're stuck with that, right? You got to think about that. They're going to be in seventh grade one day. Your name is so tied to your identity because your name comes from a place of authority. Someone in authority over your life gave you your name. And then they spoke it over you. God gave humankind dominion, authority to name the animals and creation and all of these things that are around us. It's part of our role and it anchors our identity. Your name is connected to your identity because it comes from a place of authority and it has been spoken over you. See, Jesus illustrates this Genesis principle, this Old Testament creation principle in Matthew chapter 16. Jesus is sitting and he's having this conversation with the disciples and and Peter and and Simon Peter and they're all around and they're sitting and they're talking about what, what people say about Jesus. What culture says about who he is and and his image and whether or not he really is the Messiah and how good he is. And then Jesus just puts Peter on the spot. He says, hey, but what about you? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. Jesus has a little play on words, but but he's changing Simon Peter's name. He's shifting it to to just Peter. And he says, because Peter is Petros in Greek, which means bedrock. He says, and I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, upon bedrock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Everyone say kingdom. Kingdom. Of the kingdom of heaven, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. In this moment, Jesus is coming from a position of authority, which Peter has now recognized, because he's like, well, but who do you say that I am, Peter? And Peter says, you're the Messiah, the son of the one true living God. And he says, yeah, and upon that, I'm going to give you a new name. I'm going to change your identity, and I'm going to speak over you the future that you will have, because upon bedrock, upon people that profess that I am the Messiah, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome my church. Then Jesus says, I will give you the keys to the kingdom. Which means that when you and I speak as Peter has, according to this passage, that Jesus is the Messiah, when we're faithful to speak the words of Christ, we become the bedrock upon which Christ builds his church. It's central to our identity. If you wonder why being a part of a local church is so valuable, can I tell you, because it's central to your identity to gather and profess that Jesus Christ is in fact the savior of the world. You then become the bedrock upon which he builds his kingdom on this earth. He says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, reiterating some dominion over this earth that he gave Adam back at the beginning of creation. But this is a statement that we are doing what God has decided should come to pass, that our teaching is essential, and that God's will is decisive. This is why God made us in his image, so that we could build his kingdom. God made us in his image so that his glory could be revealed through us and without those of us choosing to have identity rooted in Christ Jesus, there is no bedrock upon which he can build his kingdom on this earth. You see how valuable you are? I mean, seriously, think about this. Like, let it sink in really deep wherever you go. 
your workplace, your hallways, your classrooms, your, your team locker rooms, y- your own homes, wherever you go, when you profess that Jesus Christ is the Messiah and you allow kingdom to come through your life, you become bedrock upon which he builds his kingdom. You become bedrock upon which those around you see the good news of Jesus Christ. So here's really the challenge for you and me today. Kingdom identity transforms you and your mission. I actually believe this is one of the reasons that we, do, that we don't love the concept of kingdom identity. Because when we submit to kingdom identity, it transforms us. And it transforms our mission on this earth because our mission is rooted in our identity. It's rooted in professing that Jesus Christ is the savior of this world which God intended for you and I to profess. See, Peter's confession that Christ is the Messiah transforms not only his sin, because we often use Jesus just as a tool for salvation, and we're going to dive deep into that next week, transforms not only his sin, but his identity and his mission in building the kingdom. Jesus says, you are Peter. He's speaking the word of God over his life. See, your identity has to be rooted in the unchanging, which is in God and only God and his unfailing truth. Your identity is not an image of culture. Your identity is a gift from the creator given to you with authority so that you may walk in fulfilling his mission on this earth. Your identity has to be rooted in the unchanging for you to be anchored in this chaotic, tumultuous world. There's a passage in Psalm that actually refers to us receiving a crown of glory and we're made in the image of God. Well, you, I just, I just, I know. But I, I want this to like sink in so deep in your soul. Do you realize that not even the angels get to claim heirship with the Father? They don't get to claim that they're sons and daughters. It's humans, you and me. Have you ever thought like, man, I just wish I could be an angel? Like, wouldn't that be cool? Be able to play a harp and stuff? (laughs) Hang out with the big man? You know, the angels peer over the balcony of heaven and want to be you and me because they want a crown of glory and they want to be recognized as his sons and his daughters. It's how valuable you are to the kingdom. It's how significant his identity has to become in your life. God doesn't want to anchor your identity just so you'll feel better. God anchors your identity so that you can become bedrock upon which he builds his church. Golly, man. And again, kingdom identity transforms you and your mission. I believe it's one of the reasons that we struggle so much with with actually accepting and embracing our kingdom identity. But you got to understand this. You and I were actually made to live on mission. We were made to live with a purpose. And when we receive our purpose from the mirror of culture, our purpose changes constantly. We're like, hold on. So now, now this is my new purpose? And hold on, now I'm supposed to do that? Hold on, mullets are cool again? <laughs> That's a lot of pressure, right? I mean... I got Brillo pad hair. All I can grow is a Kentucky waterfall. (laughs) You know? She said amen because I had a mullet when I was a kid. She did that to me. Yeah, there's pictures of it that you will never see. (laughs) You and I are actually made to live on mission. Part of your identity is this desire to be a part of something bigger than yourself. I have this desire. It is a natural part of of who you and I are. We're made to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. But for some of us, we've never had the word of God spoken over us. We've never had this moment, right, where someone walks in and says, no, no, no. You're no longer Simon. You're now Peter. You're a rock upon which I will build my church. 
you're strong, you're firm, you're a foundational principle to the keys of the kingdom being used to unlock the hearts of those that haven't yet received the good news of Jesus Christ. For some of us, all that's ever been spoken over our lives is negativity, worthlessness, pain, grief, anguish. And it's why we wrestle constantly with having an identity found in hope and joy and love and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and the characteristics and the image of God. So I just want you to see what the word of God says about you because I need you to understand how valuable, not I say you are, but how valuable God says you are, how valuable the creator says you are. Like, have you ever said, you know, I'm unlovable? You ever feel that? I say I'm unlovable, but God says I'm forever loved. I say I'm scarred by the things that have happened to me in this world, but God says I'm healed. I say that I'm weak, but God says that he makes me strong. I recognize my sin, but God says that I am forgiven. I feel abandoned, yet God says that I am adopted. I feel broken, yet God says that he makes me whole. I feel rejected, but God says that I am his. I feel alone, but God says he is always with me. I feel hopeless, but God says that I have hope in him. I feel purposeless, but God says I created you with purpose. I see my failure. God says I am victorious in Christ Jesus. I feel lost. God says he will give me direction. I feel worried, anxious, or afraid. God says he is with me, that I am peace-filled. I feel unhappy. God says I give you joy. I get fearful. God says I'm powerful, loved, and have a sound mind in him. I say I'm nothing special. God says I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I see myself as worthless, yet God says Jesus died for me because I am worth it. That has to become a part of your identity. You're like, yeah, but the people that are around me that gave me my name, mom, my dad, whoever, all they've spoken is worthlessness. Yeah, but the word of God speaks new life over your identity. It's why we have to allow his word to become our identity. We're made in the image of God. Not that we will ever become equal to him, but so that we will be in pursuit of him. But it can be really hard to remember the unchanging truths that I just read. You can hear it spoken on a Sunday morning and be like, yeah, I'm with you. That makes perfect sense. And Monday comes. And that devil co-worker comes walking down the hallway, <laughs> spewing their filth and hate, right? Just being honest. You know, or someone drives 55 in the left lane on the interstate. You think, I know who God says I am. I'm more than a conqueror. Watch this trick. <laughs> life is real. And when life is real, we go back to the mirror of culture and we try to get right the things that we can control. why I buy a new pair of shoes every time I get sad. If you wonder how often pastors get sad, just think about how many pair of shoes I got. We're trying to control what we can in this moment when it feels like life is outside of our control. And it's hard to remember these unchanging truths when they aren't right in front of you. But this is one reason Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says this. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. It's Paul writing to the church in Corinth. And he's like, no, 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 no. Understand something. The Spirit of God that made you in his image now dwells within you to remind you who you are. Don't forget that you're a temple of the Holy Spirit, that he is within you, that he is a gift from God, that you are not your own, that you have been bought with a price. 
God within you. Your image no longer just a reflection. Your identity now coming from the Spirit of God dwelling within you and oozing out of you. My identity is now not bound by the external but anchored by the internal. It's one of the reasons God sent the Holy Spirit. So that his voice echoes from within us because he does not want our identity to be a reflection of culture's mirror. See, that which is within you is more valuable than that which is outside of you. Any of y'all ever heard of kale? (laughs) The devil's lettuce. Something's wrong with that stuff. See, I can buy kale and I can set it on my kitchen counter. I can sleep with it. I could take a kale bath and receive none of the benefits of kale. See, I have to eat it. I have to get it inside of me for it to become valuable. And God recognizes that your identity is so important that he sent the third head of the Trinity to dwell within you. He wants you to walk anchored by his might, power, and authority. He wants you to remember that you were created in the image of an invisible God and to anchor that identity. He sends the Holy Spirit to dwell within you. And when we back it all the way up, And we remind ourselves, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. My identity transforms me and my identity transforms my mission. Then we remember that Jesus says to his disciples before he ascends to heaven for one final time, he says, hey, guys, don't forget, I want you to stay here in Jerusalem and I don't want you to leave until you have received the power of the Holy Spirit that is to come into your life and then you will be equipped for the mission that I have given you. It's the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, anchoring your identity and your mission and your usefulness. And it's so important practically that we get our identity in Jesus Christ and God himself right because we make decisions to protect our identity. Think about your life. If your identity is in your job, you make decisions to protect your job at all costs. I'll do anything to protect my job because I find my identity in my job. If your identity is in your kids, you do anything, right? Anything, anything. Every decision you make is for your kids because that's your identity. If your identity is in money, every decision you make is about money and how money's gonna change or influence or be used or be useful. But when your identity becomes Christ, guess what you do? You make decisions to protect the reflection of Christ in your life. And no longer am I looking at the mirror of culture. I'm now anchored by the unchanging truth that I've been bought with a price, that I've been paid for, that I'm worthwhile, that I'm useful, that I can become bedrock upon which he builds his kingdom. Now what I try to protect is his glory, his presence, his peace, his gift to me. You're created in God's image for God's image. See, when you live in God's identity, you live in God's purpose. When you walk in God's words, you walk in God's promises. No longer do I look in the mirror and see hair and shoes and makeup regret or mistakes when you're anchored in the identity of Christ you look in the mirror and you begin to see life and hope and love and forgiveness the father and his goodness and the kingdom mission that your life has see when your identity gets rooted no longer are you bound to an image you're set free from the inside out and you begin to walk in the fullness of your identity because you want to walk with mission and purpose and authority. If we took a poll and said, who wants to walk in mission and purpose and authority? Everyone would raise their hand. But it starts with knowing who you are in the kingdom of God. And the very last thing I want you to see, as we wrap this all the way up, is that kingdom identity is permanent, not temporary. 
It's really important that you understand that. When you become a child of God, your kingdom identity becomes a permanent part of who you are. It's not like some temporary thing like, yeah, man, when I feel good or when I feel like praising or when I feel like worship or when I feel like shouting or when I feel like serving. No, no, no. Kingdom identity is a part of your life even when it feels like your life is off the tracks, like nothing's going the way that it should, like everything is chaos all around you. You're still a child of God. He still values you. He still has purpose for your life. He still has meaning for you and who you are. Heavenly Father, man, I thank you for every person that's in this room. And God, I just pray that you just speak your life over them, that you just speak your goodness over them. God, I pray that we would walk out of this place understanding this truth. When you look at us, you say, sweet child of mine. You call us your sons and your daughters. You care about us in every aspect of who we are. You care about us living on mission and being fruitful and living in purpose. And while we understand that our lives will never be easy simply because we call you Savior, we do understand that when we confess that you are the Savior, that we become a bedrock upon which your kingdom can come. And today I pray, God, that we would refuse to look in the mirror of culture any longer, that we would refuse to draw our identity from an image, but that we would understand that our identity is rooted in our creation story, that you created mankind in your image, that you value us so much that you gave us dominion, that you value us so much that you gave us a savior, that you value us so much that you speak your word over our lives, that you value us so much that you're willing to change our names, to change our identity so that we understand why it is that we walk this earth. And God, I believe there's so many people struggling through this life, wondering why. And I pray that if they're listening to this message, today or in the future that they would understand that the why is for your glory that the why is for your kingdom building that the why is for your purposes and as difficult as that may be to embrace God I know that when we embrace it that peace and joy and love and hope and faith and fruitfulness begin to flow through our lives heads are bowed eyes are closed all across this place maybe you came in this room today And you don't have an identity in Christ because you've never made the confession that Peter made. You've never said like, you are the Messiah, the son of the one true living God. Can I tell you if that's you today, your next step is really simple. It's simply to confess that Jesus is the savior of your life, to declare that he is Lord. And when you do that, guess what? You become a temple for the Holy Spirit that wants to anchor your identity. So we're not going to call you forward. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. People aren't looking around. But if you're in this room and you would just say, hey, pastor, that's me. Like, I've never made that confession that Jesus Christ is my savior. Would you just slip your hand up? Super safe. Nobody's looking around. Nobody's going to embarrass you in any way. We just want to say this prayer with you, believe it with you, make this confession with you. Let's all say this out loud and together. Dear Jesus, today... I confess that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. Heads bowed, eyes still closed across this place. If you came in this room and you would just be really honest and you'd be like, hey, I'm a believer, but man, I struggle to be anchored. I struggle for my identity to be anchored. Like I look in the mirror and I see everything that could change and everything that is wrong. But today I just want to rest in who he is. I want to trust the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking into my life. I want to be secured in my identity. Would you just raise your hand? I just want to pray for you, just right where you are. Heavenly Father, I thank you for every hand raised. And God, I just pray that you, through the power of your spirit, begin to speak new life into these individuals. God, I pray that when they walk out of here, they no longer see themselves first as an employee, an employer, a business owner, 
They no longer see themselves first, even as a husband or a father, but they see themselves first as a child of the one true living God, that they see themselves first as the temple through which you send your spirit to dwell, that they see themselves first as bought with the bloodshed of Jesus Christ. And God, I pray that that would begin to transform their life, that it would begin to transform their mission, that they would leave this place walking just one step closer to you, knowing what your word says about them, that you call them valued and loved and forgiven and worthy. God, I pray for strength and protection over their lives as they step into this week. God, I pray that they understand that when you look at them, you say, sweet child of mine. We give you praise and honor and thanksgiving and everybody in the house said a great big. Amen. Come on. Can we give Jesus some praise in this place?